who, in fact, is in England, in the UK, on one of his frequent visits to this country on holiday. And he's taken time out to give us a lecture and talk uh, this evening. There's really no need for me to make any formal introduction because the, the, the turnout here tonight is a demonstration that you're all uh, pretty familiar with his activities anyway. But for those of you who perhaps are coming to, as a guest, your first uh, architectural lecture, and I guess there may be one or two, it might be interesting if for a couple of minutes I paint in some background to his activities. He was born in uh, Michigan, a place called Benton Harbor, which is on the west coast of the peninsula of Michigan, which you may remember sticks up into the Great Lakes with Lake Michigan on one side and Lake Huron on the other. Indeed, Benton Harbor is perhaps only 100 miles by sea or lake uh, from Chicago. He therefore was born in the Midwest in one of the great American states. And he went on to study at Battle Creek, where he did his high school graduation, and then on to one of the great state universities of America, the University of Michigan, famous for the salt vaccine and, and football teams as well. But now, of course, also famous for architects, not least Charles Moore. And he was there, there up until 1947, and he was one of the few students to do an actual building while he was a student. I don't know whether you remember Jones Cottage, uh, which is not, as I have ever found, illustrated anywhere, but maybe that will come through tonight. He then went on with a George Booth Travelling Fellowship to study in the Near East and in Europe, and later he did his draft, or what we call national service, and perhaps what we all call conscription, in the US Army Corps of Engineers, which that took him to Korea and Japan. And from then he really started his work in California and the that east western seaboard. Perhaps th that is enough as an introduction from me, but I'm sure he's going to show you what has happened in the rest of his life as one of America's leading architects. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles Moore. Thank you very much. Am I on? Is it? <laughs> if I mumble, which I will, uh, you're meant to stomp your feet or something, and then they'll turn it up louder. I understand. It's very exciting for me to be here. Well, it's exciting anyway, but it's exciting to be here <laughs> uh, 24 hours after uh, Robert Venturi, who is an old friend and uh, uh, believes uh, many of the same things that I do, and in fact, in some cases, believes them first. Uh, <laughs> although he announced that he was more interested in being best than, than first. I'm going to show you the second set of super graphics, for instance, and <laughs> things like that. Uh, but it does become incumbent on me, therefore, I think, to, um, to try to describe what I've thought and what I've done, uh, with, always with various other people, uh, in terms that fit with, uh, with those that Venturi was describing last night. The, it's hard to do that because um, I think most of the things in words come out pretty much the same, though the work is different. Venturi said about it, mine at one point, that it was too hot, and I countered that his was probably too cool, uh, but that doesn't make them very different. Uh, what I think comes closer to being at issue is uh, the something that I'll, I'll call reality, um, although my version of reality I'm sure is quite different from other people's and everybody differs from everybody else's. There's a T.S. Eliot quote that I'm fond of that um, announces that the function of the, the playwright, and by extension, the artist of any sort, is to give some, give the viewer, the, uh, the audience, some conception of an, an order in reality in order that the 
the viewer, the viewers might uh, then make for themselves some clearer image of the function of, of the order of reality. Uh, what's present in all that for, for Venturi and for me and for a number of others of us is reality. Uh, the, the notion of, of uh, things that are important to people or buildings that are important to their inhabitants. Uh, and I think that it's reality in contrast to the order, which was what um, people of Venturi's in my generation were, who were, went to architecture school were raised up to be most interested in, uh, that um, has been what we have been particularly caring about. It seems to me worth noting that um, although we're told that the opposite of rational is irrational, and I don't know how many times I've been told by various people who would meet me in the street that they represented the rational, which was presumably good, and I represented the irrational, which was presumably suspicious, uh, suspect, shifty, uh, slimy, uh, undependable and probably bad. Uh, it seems to me proper to note that, that as rational is standardly used, was used by Bob Venturi last night, uh, its opposite is not irrational so much as it is real. That uh, the rational is the, the made up uh, view of, of things. I like to liken it to uh, the medieval view of, of uh, two objects of five times different weight that would, according to those rational believers of that period, have uh, dropped to the ground the light one, um, one-fifth as fast as the, the heavy one. Some other chap uh, dropped a couple of weights off the leaning tower of Pisa and demonstrated that the rationalists were all wet, and they countered by excommunicating him. Uh, the, I think now as then, uh, the number of people with uh, views very carefully built up of how architecture and other aspects of our society should work, um, those, those people and those views uh, regard with deep suspicion a set of questions about them, a set of announcements like the Venturi ones that uh, uh, messy might be preferable to uh, neat or ambiguous to, to clear. Um, my contribution to this is, uh, well, it's not a very important contribution, but it, it's uh, something I like to call the postcard theory, um, which doesn't work, but it's, it's a good theory. Um, in the ways that theories ought to work, um, which is that, that probably the best way in our century of telling what worth a building has, how good it is, is to see how many people send postcards from it. If, uh, if people go to a building, a place, like it, feel at home there, feel as though they belong, feel like dancers say, centered on it, they have a tendency to send a postcard to their friends and relatives saying, wish you were here. That's a shorthand for saying, I feel good in this place and want you to feel good too. Uh, this is not a very complete theory in that nobody has ever sent a postcard of any of my buildings and <laughs> therefore it can't be right, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, it does suggest that what has been unreal, unsuccessful, about the, the rational discoveries that we've been treated so heavily to uh, during the middle part of this century, is that they don't seem to include human occupancy and uh, the satisfaction of the people who uh, build, pay for, inhabit, uh, visit, or otherwise deal with, uh, with the buildings on this planet. I think if there is a difference 
Well, there are lots of differences, but one of the differences between Venturi and uh, myself and my partners is that, uh, that I think, and I don't think this is unfair, that for, for him and his partners, uh, the, the uh, populist, the, the Las Vegas and Levittown and other enthusiasms that, that they uh, have developed are to provide a substance that can be turned into to art in the same way, much the same way that uh, Japanese tea masters found uh, excitement in rough hewn but uh, full of character and full of the spirit of the people um, objects which gained in their hands great value and became the objects that um, forwarded the, the tea ceremony the chance to uh, to make art of a most esoteric complete uh, pure uh, truthful sort out of out of um, out of the real my stuff and my partners is I think uh, sort of easier and perhaps sloppier than than that with uh, the the vernacular stuff that I'm going to show pictures of, of, of um, the North American continent and elsewhere, uh, beginning of a chance to, to extend of what we do, to, to include as much as we can uh, the, the inhabitants, the, the people who, who deal with the buildings. And what I'm going to describe as I make a, I hope a, adequately quick run through through uh, through our, our work and our notions um, is a, a, what might even be a progression toward the involvement of lots of people uh, in uh, the making of, of the buildings and and the inhabiting of them if there are some principles and uh, I'm going to list some, though it doesn't make it symmetrical with last night. Um, maybe there are three that, that um, take some precedence. One that has seemed to me so for a long time is that buildings can and must speak. Um, there, I know that uh, buildings are not what they want to be, that they're caused to be some way by by architects and others who, who design them. I know that buildings are not animate. But um, for my purposes, I have to suppose that they have some life. Um, and uh, that in most of this century, we've had the problem that, that propriety has limited down to almost nothing what buildings can say to it. Um, it ends up in many competitions that most houses, for instance, look like savings and loan associations because that's the only kind of institution in our world with enough supposed dignity to uh, be worthy of, of buildings. They can only talk in the tones of bankers. Um, I think that's nonsense and that if there is to be some liveliness, some interest in buildings that they have to be uh, be able to say what, what they want to say. Miss Vanderoy used to uh, Say, or at least he said on some record that I own. I don't want to be interesting. I want to be good. Um, that's wonderful, and uh, uh, he was very good. And um, uh, Bob was even saying something like it last night when he was announcing that he wanted to be best rather than first. Uh, it seems to me that it's very useful for the rest of us architects, leaving me to do that, and Bob even. Um, to turn it around and say, uh, though it would be nice to be good, it is also very important if our buildings are to matter to the world we're building them for, to be interesting. And I think one of the excitements of um, our current, perhaps it's postmodern era, is that, that it gets into the weekly news magazines in the United States anyway, and with color pictures, which uh, it never used to when it was 
well, black and white in the first place, and, and, uh, uh, and really not worth the full page at the price pages are. Uh, a second uh, principle is that that buildings are there to be inhabited. That's not only houses, but um, every kind of building uh, that's meant for humans, which is one of the definitions of architecture, um, any kind of building that's meant for humans has to be inhabitable by humans. And we take for granted the act of, of inhabiting, <coughs> uh, thinking that it's enough if a shelter comes over our heads. But uh, uh, it's turned out, in our century anyway, to be in many cases, and in most cities, extremely difficult to, to inhabit the environment that, that's been uh, made for us. Dancers use, perhaps more, more usefully to us, the term centered um, to say when they feel as though they themselves, their bodies, are in the middle of things and uh, the world is, is meant for them uh, to be in. They feel good there, as though they might even send a postcard. Uh, and, uh, and buildings have to support that, that capacity. Uh, that leads to principle number three, which is um, a related one, that buildings, and this I'm indebted to my sometimes partner, Don Linden, for the phrasing of, um, that buildings are, are the recipients of, of human energy. They're interesting on many other energy counts, but most importantly, um, they're places that, that take our energies, our love and our care, and um, absorb it, and when they get enough of it, they start to, to pay it back, like the biblical bread cast upon the waters, coming back, as we know, club sandwiches. The, they, they, they take all this energy from people, um, and they aren't going to have enough of it unless not only the architect's energy, the designer's energy, but also the, the inhabitant's energy, the energy of the people who have anything to do with it, the builders and, and the people who pay for it, and even the bankers who talk to them. Uh, unless uh, as much energy as possible flows in, so uh, that some can come back to all the people who care and who are, who are there. Now this says to me, and it says it more and more, that, uh, that the architect's role is, is one of, of deprofessionalizing, of making uh, a, a line of work that more and more we share with, with others, with the people who, who inhabit our buildings. This is, this is tough medicine in some ways because we know that the, the professions that, that are more and more professional, doctors and lawyers are the famous instances in our time, uh, make, for instance, a lot of money. Um, and um, especially in the case of, well, in the case of law, lawyers and doctors both, uh, other people who are not one or the other of those groups can scarcely afford to get along without the services of those, uh, those groups and to pay them well uh, for the, the increasingly arcane uh, stuff that, that, they, that they provide us with. In the case of architects, I have friends in the clergy who note a strong parallel. Uh, the, our role, if it's to work in an era when people don't know much about what it's like to inhabit a building. Uh, many people have never had a satisfactory inhabitation. It's a little Freudian in, in its um, implications. Uh, uh, it's, it's necessary for us to, uh, uh, to give away our arcane professional secrets, to share them with, uh, with the people with whom we deal. In the same way as my friends in the clergy say, that no clergyman ever saved anybody's soul. All he did was help people 
to save their own souls. Same way we as architects never cause anybody to inhabit a building. All we do is help set things up so that people, um, the inhabitants themselves, uh, can, can do that. So we're faced with, with in these times, as, as architects, with a pair of alternatives. Uh, the purity of the temple, if I can put it that way, the, the excitements that have um, pervaded uh, modern architecture and its successor efforts for most of this century, questions of whether to be first or best. Um, and um, on the other hand, uh, as a choice, the, the energy of the world outside. Um, now, obviously, we all hedge our bets and care about um, the lore of our, our field at the same time what we're caring about uh, including others in on it. Or maybe this is um, some kind of parallel to the order and reality that T.S. Eliot um, makes it clear that we, we need both of. Um, I'll show now a number of slides with, with some mix um, of order and reality. Less order, I suspect, than Venturi had last night, and uh, whether more or less reality, uh, we'll see. Um, I should note about all this that, and Venturi made some suggestions about it, that uh, architects come, I think, in, in two groups, well, on many counts, but um, one uh, separation that we might conduct is to note that for some people, for many of the architects we know, a theory of what to do, what's important, comes first, and buildings follow after that as, um, as illustrations, as instances of the theory. Uh, for, and I've had partners whom I admire greatly of that sort. For some of the others, among whom I'd include myself, there is, it starts with some chemical inner need to make buildings of a given sort, and the theories that come, come almost entirely after the fact as uh, illustrations of the correctness of the chemical notions that, that uh, are, are besetting us. So I'm going to show tonight um, the standard uh, format for most lectures by architects. First, a set of things that I admire, um, and culminating with a pair of slides that I admire greatly, followed closely by my own work, um, so that you will feel that there is some of the magic of the stuff that comes just before in it. Um, if I time it right, that should happen. Uh, Uh, the first slides are, are really devoted to uh, notions that, and, and, and that were partly described in, in these first remarks. Uh, the slides that start this are on the left. Thomas Jefferson, uh, one of the first great architects in North America and uh, also a political leader who uh, whose great pride was his university, the University of Virginia, which uh, is in microcosm all the things that he thought were important about architecture, which he felt would, if it used the right models and did them well, uh, would make his small, uh, underpopulated and poverty-stricken new country uh, rise large in, in the eyes of of humankind. So he has uh, made an, at the University of Virginia a set of ten professors' houses that uh, represent, I think, some sort of symbols of aristocracy, uh, with at the head of the group, not a church but a library and a meeting hall, um, and uh, in between a set of student rooms with uh, small uh, columns, a colonnade in front of them. Um, and I think it, although I don't suppose he intended it specifically, 
I think it's interesting that when these buildings actually exist and, and speak to us, as they do, it certainly is the most powerful complex of buildings on our continent, uh, that sometimes the, the, let's link them to democracy, these small columns in front of the students' rooms um, slide behind the columns of the professor's pavilion, which will link with aristocracy. In other cases, they slide right in front of the aristocracy and the hell with it. Um, and I think that set of tensions back and forth and, and uh, democratic are surely the ones that Jefferson was otherwise dealing with and which meant a lot to him. This is a much gentler, uh, more modest set of occurrences in a, a village in the south of Mexico where somebody long ago made a a simple conventional uh, set of shapes, a set of arcades and, and pilasters. And then people in the years since have described their own particular in interests by painting them differently, sometimes on the module of the column of the arcades and sometimes not. So that um, in a very simple way with paint, this, uh, this plaza is, is getting human care, human energy, and is staying by that uh, means alive. It's interesting, I think, that people from the beginning of architecture have uh, operated both in some normative way, as on the left, working for hundreds of years to make uh, a, a Greek Doric order that uh, was exactly the way they wanted it. And um, also people have operated in a one-off, uh, don't try to develop it manner. I'm sure the people who made that window in this finished church didn't have any presumption that it was going to lead to some kind of normalization, which would wind up 15 churches later with the window in the center. They put the window where it needed to be. Uh, there are excitements about the upright human form. Um, as we all know, we and penguins share the distinction of being the only creatures on this planet that uh, hold their heads on top of their bodies instead of hanging out in front like apes or in some other, we believe, less desirable fashion. So that, uh, that buildings that, that recall that specialty of ours are, uh, or other structures are highly regarded. When vertical pieces are put up, columns, they are often given something to hold up to make it all seem worthwhile. Uh, it was one way for the people who made Stonehenge, another way for this farmer in western Massachusetts who, uh, who apparently thought that he could have a nice home behind these uh, symbols of strength and humanness. His family grew and the house squirted out the back, but uh, that didn't render any less valuable the symbols that he had for the front of it. Uh, the human form itself, a couple times here in Venice, once uh, for real with a gondolier and once uh, with a, a human figure at the top of some stairs in, in uh, uh, the courtyard of the Doge's palace, convinces us of, uh, of, the, of our own existence um, as a set of surrogate inhabitants of the space, well, a surrogate inhabitant on the left hand, a real one, on the right, uh, join us. Um, and um, that excitement continues in other statues and columns as those in Wies on the left, um, or these of Carl Friedrich Schinkel's in the um, Aldous Museum in, in Berlin um, on the right, where you get to share in the uprightness and excitement of this ionic column by coming up the stairs and winding up pretty high on it. Making places for people just to be is an important thing that architects do that, that um, has gotten to be of less concern in the recent decades than it often is in the architecture of the past. Places to sit or places where human feet can, for instance, walk upstairs, an act that's virtually forbidden in the United States by this time now that the wheelchair lobby has been so effective. Um, Buildings communicate, as we all know, in 
with signs, as on the left-hand uh, one, which tells us everything you need to know, everything that ever happened in the place, including the visit of John F. Kennedy, um, or with a kind of body language, like this uh, barn in southern Finland, where, which is on a, a slight hill, in some way manages with the way it deftly sort of swivels down that hill, uh, at once to be fixed in place uh, and uh, responsive to the uh, the slight slope. On the North American experience has uh, been one of there being places beyond. So not only are you at rest, but also there's some sense of of a great uh, land generally to the west or over the sea or somewhere. And this uh, Bierstadt of, Yo of, Yellow of Yosemite on the left or a porch in Newport both have that sense of somewhere beyond. But Americans are not, uh, we're not peasants. That is, we don't, we haven't, we're not attached to the land. We're, we're uh, invaders who come from places, islands like this one, to uh, far away um, to to make our homes in, in various places on the on the continent. I'm very proud of my great great grandfather who who uh, was a farm boy in Michigan 150 years ago, and who uh, uh, at the same time that he was shooting and doing the things you do on the frontier, he was keeping his uh, farm notes in Latin and his personal diaries in Greek because he wanted to be very sure that, that he was not only a, an inhabitant of the land, which he was very much interested in, but uh, some way hooked into uh, to Western civilization as a much bigger thing. And I think it's that hooking up to uh, all of Western civilization that animates the architects that we've been lately talking about and that are working today. On this side is, is a genuine autochthonous, as Frank Lloyd Wright would have had it, um, indigenous place, um, Nishong Novi, a Hopi village made by people in North America who are, in fact, attached to the land. On the other screen is uh, the city hall in Gilroy, which is uh, California, which is uh, laden with pretension. And I guess we have to accept that for sort of mini conquerors like ourselves, that uh, pretension is uh, one of the key ingredients in our, in our work and our attitude, and we should have, enjoy it. Um, part of pretension has to do with, with making objects and enjoying them. The elephant in New Jersey is famous, but uh, so is, is the Airstream trailer uh, with its own sense of, of uh, centeredness and existence. It isn't very good at connecting with things. In fact, it slithers in and out of uh, funny places. But, uh, but it's, it's got a quality that lets us inhabit it, really, with more ease than we can inhabit most of the things that our society has produced. It's worth noting that this possibility of inhabiting things is based to some considerable extent on the existence of the familiar. Bob Venturi talked about that last night at some length. Um, I show a town along the Ohio River where uh, for decades there was considerable agreement about what, what needed, what constituted a building along the main street. It came right to the main street. Um, it had a lot of glass so that you could see the shops that were there. It had more private offices on the floor above. It had um, some fanciness. A lot of variation. Each of these is quite different from the others. Um, at at its cornice line, and um, sometimes around the windows, and made within, like Georgian houses in London, uh, within a very uh, tight framework, the excitement of of unlimited possibilities for making variation that made sense uh, within a framework of the familiar. You can even have a, a porch as uh, in the right hand part of the left-hand slide. But what you can't do is forget the whole thing, which is what they did afterward, is in the, that, I suppose it's a bank that uh, um, sits 
isolated from all those things just to the, to the left of that porch or in the very left-hand part of, of this slide where the, the conventions have been uh, flouted. There are conventions that we make up in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, they made up uh, a set of conventions about, about their city that said that it was Spanish, which it never was. Uh, but they made a lot of really wonderful buildings based on that, that Spanishness. They still consider it today, although in a kind of latter-day manner, as they hook together two trailers to make uh, double-wide houses with plastic Spanish tile <coughs> decorating them. I think the latter-day one comes off perhaps less well than the courthouse. Um, there are also some excitements, some, some connections with convention in making things out of the special things that are available. In Mitchell, South Dakota, uh, they have a lot of corn, and uh, so they make the front of their corn palace out of, uh, out of tassels and ears and, and uh, other pieces of, of corn and replace it when it falls apart. Um, a couple, Alex and Phyllis Madonna, He's a, a highway contractor, find themselves with a lot of boulders on their hands. And so they've made their motel, the Madonna Inn, which has achieved some fame in, in uh, Central California, out of those boulders. Um, he supplying the boulders, which are often shined up, and she's supplying usually pink velvet, which makes a interesting foil uh, to, the, to the boulders and, and causes the place to be... Um, impossible to get into without at least six months of uh, advance notice. Uh, the famous California architect Bernard Maybeck uh, did it with local stone and corrugated iron. The architects of the Old Faithful Lodge in Yellowstone National Park uh, did it with, uh, with a set of, of uh, natural or rough wood pieces with uh, a, a three-part top that makes its own special kind of column capital. Bernard Maybeck did it some more, again drawing heavily on classical precedents in a temporary building for the 1915 San Francisco Fair, which uh, public demand caused to be recast in eternal concrete some decades later. Some very special places are made to lodge human uh, love and attention. The otherwise fairly simple church of San Seno in Verona, is one known to you, where uh, not much happens most of, on most of it, but at the doors um, there's a special chance to, uh, to make a set of pictures that uh, are so important to the people who have looked at them for several hundred years that uh, they've almost worn away with uh, the touch of human hands and have been useful as their, with their connection to human minds. The Indians, in, uh, the Tarascan Indians in the Mexican state of Michoacan uh, give their young people when they marry a, a cart with um, the pieces for a log cabin on it. Uh, it's all very, very simple, not at the corners, but the parents of the young couple the fathers make, uh, make a pair of, of doorposts which they carve lovingly and, and uh, with great care and which give them a place to, to lodge their, <coughs> their love, their intentions, to aid in the act of inhabitation both for themselves and for their kids. In uh, the California of the Gold Rush, uh, Fire stations were a place where a good deal of attention was lodged. And in uh, Disneyland and Disney World on the North American continent today, where the usual strictures against uh, uh, wearing your heart on your sleeve are not operative, uh, the possibilities of making things that are, are full of, uh, of care and clearly of excitement to the many people who go and indeed do send postcards. Um, those excitements are evident. 
I think it's interesting in those places to note how close the fantasies of the past, um, the castles of Snow White, Cinderella, etc., how close those fantasies are to the fantasies of the future. It's even made it possible for me to develop a theory which is not altogether worked out, which is that the future ended in 1957, which is, <laughs> that's the year they took the house of the future away from Disneyland and uh, called a halt to the whole thing. It's certainly the case that, that in, uh, in the 30s, when I was a child listening to the radio and hearing the adventures of Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon and people like that, that the supposition was general that the future was going to have absolutely nothing to do with, with the past, and the supposition of the architects of that period was, was similar. We're going to cleanse ourselves of the past to, to hit the future. It's equally evident now, no matter what group one uh, stands among, that, uh, that our future, whatever it will be, is going to have a great deal of the past in it. It's going to be, a, be continuous with any luck, seamless with, uh, with that past, with certain cleanup jobs occurring, but, uh, but with, with its richness a part of, of the continuousness of life on this planet and not alien from it. Um, another aid in the inhabitation of spaces, maybe, one of the, maybe the most important one, is, as Lucan and many others have said, um, light. Um, this, these are pictures of the Kimball Museum uh, next to Thomas Jefferson's university, I think the most powerful piece of work on, on our continent um, in Fort Worth, Texas, where, where Khan has made a, a set of, of uh, vaults with light coming down through a slot in the middle, which the light reflects onto those vaults, and so you get a uh, on the vaults through the day a vivid um, interpretation of, uh, of the vivid Texas sky, which is bright with uh, lots of little clouds scudding around in it, so that uh, you're at once outdoors and, uh, and separate from the outdoors in a place where you can look at the, the paintings. The vaults are themselves a fairly insistent uh, shape, but they're opened up underneath, as in this as this picture shows, so that uh, that you can move independently of the, that strong discipline of the vault and uh, in light um, inhabit an extraordinarily ambiguous and wonderful space. This I think well enough enough of so that I will now go into our own slides. Um, and what I'll do is run quickly through uh, early things in order to get at more recent ones. Um, the condominium at the Sea Ranch of long ago started most of the notions that um, I have been describing here. I think it's fair to say that, that in the not quite 20 years since, um, since this was, was built, that we've, we've interested ourselves more and more in, uh, in the involvement of other people, and more and more in the involvement of images past uh, what, we're, what is right, right there. This early work, um, which I still have a house in and I'm very fond of, um, was, was meant to be a pretty largely functional response to, to, a, to a complicated climate, including testing from uh, low-speed wind tunnels, the making of a courtyard that uh, was supposed to be Winfrey and basically is. The first scheme for this building, it turned out, that we had made without the testing would have caused you to be swept into the surf as you walked from your parked car to your front door. Um, it's never really warm enough to, to want to be outside so that a kind of conceptual outside replaces it as in, uh, in this picture. and. Uh, a further inside with, uh, with little rooms uh, goes inside the, the container uh, with a, a taut redwood skin um, and uh, uh, 
little house inside the big one with uh, a, the best possible 17th century structure to uh, <laughs> hold it all together. Um, also at the Sea Ranch, um, it became our task to uh, uh, <coughs> to uh, make a place out of the wind for swimming and tennis, and a wind dam, which became the the place for for changing and sauna, uh, with uh, what is I think after Bob Venturi's Grand Restaurant, maybe the second instance of super graphics on the North American continent done by uh, Barbara Stoffaker, now Solomon, or being second, of course, we try harder. Uh, our, we get closer to, uh, to an overt pickup of, uh, of the, the local imagery here in Santa Barbara, uh, which had, as I mentioned before, gone some decades before Spanish in the <coughs> faculty club. Um, which we took some pains to uh, to bring up to date on the on the inside with neon banners and to uh, enjoy the the ordinariness of in the space between the inner and outer walls um, that uh, wrapped the building um, that were lit by Richard Peters, the lighting consultant. Um, with a blue fluorescent, are still, um, with incandescent inside and outside, so that this are a four foot thick blanket of blue uh, wrapped around the structure. Um, this Kresge College um, at the University of California at Santa Cruz a few years later uh, also is, uh, is wrapping structures with, with more structures in what is meant to be an ordinary way and also is, and particularly, is involved with making a set of buildings that turn into stage sets, into flats, that uh, let it be possible for the, the inhabitant to be the center of the scene, centered, as dancers would have it, uh, coming up the street or in his or her room. Uh, with uh, the only monuments allowed to us by the students who, had, who were taking part in the design of this, uh, the only monuments being trivial ones like this lopsided triumphal arch in front of the library. They wouldn't allow us to name even the, the main room, saying that the rooms had to find out in the best Judeo-Christian tradition what they wanted to be. So they did let us number the student rooms, uh, but a couple years later we saw them putting these names on. They called the library, library and uh, the student center, student center, um, but they didn't want to do it too soon. This, this one did change its, its function and, and uh, is now an outdoor dining terrace inside that, that rotunda. Um, there were housing projects that were doing the same thing, trying to make place, a uh, sense of place by uh, by differentiating between one public space and another, or in the case of this one in Long Island, uh, making a, the distinction between a kind of crust of buildings along a major highway and uh, uh, smaller fourplexes that are about at the scale of the big old houses that lie across the, the quiet residential street from them. With the, the crust under a single roof to enhance its crust-likeness. And uh, the fourplexes, three of them dead simple and not expensive. Um, the fourth one with a little money added to make a porch that would get down to the size of human beings so as to enhance the sense of having something to do with this building as you walk by it. Um, Williamsburg. and. Virginia is a very special place that millions of visitors come to annually, and uh, we were asked to do some developer housing there that didn't get built. Uh, we thought if people wanted to live there, 
in a really terrible climate, they must like it in Williamsburg, and so it would be a good idea to have it um, so they would like it, so that it um, would remind them of that place. So we were happy to um, run through a kind of all-American number from a kind of lumpy 17th century house on the left through recollections of a Thomas Jefferson pavilion next to 18th century colonial to a 19th century federal number made out of plywood. Our notion was that though we couldn't afford the beautiful moldings that are on standard 1830 houses and along the eastern seaboard of the United States, we could maybe put in some simple pieces that doesn't work quite right in this model that would give us federal shadows, uh, which would be about as much um, recollection as was either necessary or proper. Um, recollections occur too in this house for a, a blind client in uh, and a sight, his sighted family um, in the suburbs of New York where uh, it's meant to be a fairly modest house so it's a very big one um, and the notion was that uh, there would be to accommodate him and his desire to know just where he was a set of uh, of discrete um, rooms based, in fact, on rooms that he uh, took us to look at uh, that he felt comfortable in, which were usually rectangular and high and had uh, stone walls. Uh, we enjoyed making with these ordinary pieces, clapboards, uh, double hung windows, and even triple hung ones, as Thomas Jefferson invented them, um, both the fairly a special pavilion there and in the other picture a standard a rectangle that reminded um, him of his Ohio boyhood and me of my Michigan one with the one place in between where there was a chance to to uh, uh, to get disoriented uh, filled with a or provided with, with a, a railing that lets him run his fingers loosely along it and know just where he is as he goes from one wing of the house to the other. This is all set up with, uh, with plants of great fragrance and with a, a, a pool fountain in the floor that, that splashes water with little, well it goes over little weirs made of, of uh, copper that I tune from time to time so they'll sound like, uh, like a running brook and not like a toilet flushing. There it is on the left, and, and here a uh, room, the living room, which is typical of, of the sort of place in which he, without being able to see people, can feel comfortable that he knows just who's with him. A house in, in California uh, devoted to a, a pair of sort of opposite interests of its owner, one a very fine pipe organ, and the other a kind of sybaritic uh, Southern California poolside um, orgiastic atmosphere <laughs> with, uh, with a kind of Edgar Allan poetic study that, that <laughs> slips up uh, um, full of potential ravens uh, to a third floor tower and kind of easy places to be around the edges in between. A house for a, a teacher um, in Southern California who uh, has wants uh, to have it comfortable when he's there alone with, or with one or two others um, but also has to be able to uh, seat up to 50 people um, in, in the living room. A house for a, a bachelor professor of English at UCLA who, uh, um, who invites the whole um, Royal Shakespeare crowd over when they come to LA to uh, uh, play on the front uh, porch, um, the front uh, deck. It's actually uh, built over a, what used to be a canyon, but which has been filled in with, with uh, orange trees. So the earlier schemes all had a, a two-story truss, which that curved wall intersected with. And we found ourselves in some difficulty when it turned out that the two-story truss was more expensive than than a simple grade beam. So we have a trellis now that, that makes the, um, makes the,
plane where the truss was supposed to be. Um, and uh, slides on through the living room. Now, the living room is now furnished, but it wasn't when this picture was taken. Um, and now has a bunch of theater lights on it to, uh, to help strengthen that truss. House in Singapore, um, which, like all these houses, is filled with curious paradoxes. Uh, this one, um, in Singapore, is, Singapore is a very beautiful place, but as you know, hot and muggy, and you really feel comfortable only when the air conditioning is on. So uh, uh, this, is, this is an attempt to have a set of, of uh, rooms that, are, um, that look out into to, uh, open courtyards which are somewhat shaded, um, but uh, that depend on color to link the inside spa indoor spaces and the outdoor spaces um, and uh, to make you feel as though you're in the garden even though you're inside uh, uh, with the air conditioning on. This is a house um, in Colorado that was the result of a competition, which a little competition which we won um, for a a very big scale developer who flies people in in his uh, Learjet and uh, uh, maybe three couples um, gives them a nice dinner made by the caretakers who live in this apartment um, and uh, then comes back in a couple of weeks and, and uh, um, signs the contracts after they've been skiing and are happy with their environment. Um, the, it's built around a, an 80 foot um, spruce tree um, and um, um, has a gorgeous view of the confluence of two streams off, off to the left um, so that entrance is through a front door and then up a flight of stairs that are meant to bring to mind Douglas Fairbanks Jr. or Sr. of uh, uh, sword playing his way in the face of an adversary um, you slip up to uh, to a living room on top with a view of all this, and then back on the dining room, kitchen, back on down to a sort of guest living room and a set of, of guest suites below. It was important to the owner and to us that, uh, that the house be recollective of uh, an ordinary Colorado farmhouse. It's got a sort of pewter colored metal uh, roof and uh, this um, a courtyard with the which holds the 80-foot tree, with 34 beautiful stained glass windows, lately made, that they, you look out through uh, to the tree, and a porch all the way around to cope with the snow. With um, the living room with lots of windows that look at the rivers and at the south sun, and a backside that's uh, more modest. happening. Okay. Um, this model maybe shows better the, the way the tree fills up the site and is demanding of us extreme ingenuity about Christmas lighting. <laughs> um, another um, paradox, which most of these things that have to do with living seem to be. Um, this is, uh, it didn't get built, um, 150 uh, condominiums on the south shore of the Hawaiian island of Kauai. Uh, the breeze goes through um, from mountain to sea or sea to mountain depending on the time of day. So to avoid air conditioning it's essential to have the, the plans all go through. They all have to have a view of the water which is to the south and uh, uh, they really have no reason to be very much different the one from another and yet to have a bunch of, of apartments lined up like soldiers like that would seem to be deadly so the real task was to uh, this is the ocean side in the front uh, to try to make uh, a set of porches and, and uh, special things that would make all these places seem special at the same time that they were uh, basically the same a house uh, or it's a place for 16 scientists to stay during conferences 
um, in the yard of a big old Palladian house on Long Island. It's going to be dedicated in two weeks. Um, its owner, the director of, of the laboratory, uh, didn't want uh, to have a motel wing on that fine old house, and neither did I. Um, so this is, um, it was meant to be Palladian. They wonder whether it doesn't look a little more like a 19th century railroad station. But <laughs> it's got a nice big high space in the middle, palladian -ly. Whoops, sorry. Two more things for the same laboratory. A, uh, an auditorium that gets south sun in to uh, heat um, walls and help um, make energy conservation. The Cancer Research Center that's meant to look as though it's not even there but was there all along, which is very important to the town in which this lab is located. Um, this one we're very proud of. It was the first lab on the, on the site, um, 1895, with a beautiful dark board a beaded interior um, and the need to make uh, a laboratories that uh, would allow scientists to study the brain waves and sea slugs. Now it turns out that the brain waves and sea slugs are, are not impressive and, uh, <laughs> uh, and the scientists have to have their own separate foundations and air conditioning systems and everything in order to have it quiet enough so they can commune with these creatures. But uh, it also turns out that after they've done that for a while, they really long for the sight of humankind. And so they come out into this, this final building with views of the, the water through double hung windows that roll up and uh, of a nice fire and an old cobblestone fireplace, both of which we managed to save. This is another um, high tech number. Uh, the world's first, catch this, um, energy efficient uh, uh, over 20 years um, uh, cost effective National Guard and Arm Army Reserve Armory, um, <laughs> making it perhaps the first. Um, the, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's monitored by, by Arthur D. Little computers and, and other high-tech things. Um, I was amused at, at Bob Venturi's uh, uh, Corps of Engineers castle last night because I, I didn't know he had it, but I have one too. Uh, <laughs> in fact, the coins in the castle were my, my chief contributions to this highly energy efficient structure, which is indeed saving 80% of the energy bills and will become, uh, will pay for itself in six years and has active and passive and every other kind of system and uh, does it all just right. And also has a castle and coins. <laughs> Uh, this one didn't happen. Um, it's uh, on a, an advancing beach in St. Simon's Island in Georgia. And to please the people in their single family houses along the beach, this 300 unit condominium hotel uh, was made to be a very sort of gentle and old timey on the outside and to be as its purpose demanded, relatively orgiastic on the inside with uh, or shutters for people to make goo-goo eyes out of that, uh, <laughs> that other people in the, in the courtyard and many other diversions. Uh, we've interested ourselves in, in, in waterworks and fountains ever since I did a doctoral dissertation on it 30 years ago. Um, this with Lawrence Halperin uh, 15 years ago in, in Portland, Oregon, is I, I show it for a second as a contrast to what's going to come next because this was uh, this was made to remind us of a, a waterfall in the High Sierra, but was made with six inch uh, concrete steps poured behind two by six boards used for forms so as to be uh, inexpensive on the one hand and uh, to abstract the notion of the of the waterfall in the High Sierra on the other. So the water comes down in lots of vivid and, and splashy ways, but within the, the discipline of, uh, of those steps. 
when it came time uh, ten years later to uh, to make a fountain, it seemed to us reasonable to uh, to be less abstract, more more flat-footed. The fountain was for the Italian community in New Orleans, and it therefore seemed okay. We asked, we sat around, asked each other, what is the most Italian thing we can think of to shape this fountain like? We had made a competition entry which came in second, um, which shows over here. There's a building in the upper left corner, and then we made this elliptical uh, piazza, which turned into a circle because the winning group had a circle, and we were the fountain consultants as runners-up. Um, we had just scrunched up these black and white stripes into a um, any old shaped fountain, kind of like the one in Portland that I just showed. But then, as we talked, we wanted it to be more Italian. And somebody pointed out that the most Italian thing we could think of was Italy. Um, and uh, so we decided it would be all right to scrunch it up into to Italy, uh, Sicily in the middle, uh, Sardinia at the side, it's backward. Um, Um, and then, though we didn't have enough water yet, um, we thought, well, what else is Italian? And uh, I think it was I that it came over that uh, that the architectural orders were, with a little help from the Greeks, and it would be all right to put some of those up and squirt water around on them, make them, make them out of water. So we made several attempts. That one on the left is a, a middle one, and uh, ended up doing that. with uh, the expectation not yet realized that there would be buildings all around that would sell Gucci and Gucci and, and other Italianate things. Uh, we meanwhile studied, on the left is, is uh, an egg and dart molding made out of water and spoons, and here not yet working, and not working any longer because it's all stuffed up, is uh, an attempt to, to make acanthus leaves out of water that would uh, cluster around the, this uh, column cap um, with uh, Tuscan ones uh, going simply down. And uh, on the left, Doric ones, more like a Doric helmet than a, than a Doric uh, column. Uh, my interest had been in having a truck windshield wipers splashing back and forth across that, that uh, uh, stainless steel surface that, that now has my face on it. But I was told that truck windshield wipers were in bad taste, as I... <laughs> as I had been told earlier that my scheme to put tiki torches on Vesuvius and Etna was in very bad taste. <laughs> but we do have water and Sometimes there are very large crowds who gather for Italian festivals. And then there is neon, which says a lot of interesting things about convention, too. Since the water um, has pleased most people, this also had a lot of, of uh, help from, uh, from the Italian community in, in making it happen. And the water is, is popular. What is not so popular among many is the neon, which uh, reminds people of, of cheap bars and other places that members of the family go to. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, um, so it's been less a success and is less often turned on. Uh, this almost last uh, piece is uh, uh, part of another kind of, of, uh, of working with people, a team of 11 architects who made a prize-losing competition f for uh, uh, the top of Bunker Hill in Los Angeles, a billion-dollar uh, urban renewal project with the highest tower by Cesar Pelli, um, to the next tower by Bob Kennard, a local architect, uh, up to the left, Barton Myers from Toronto, to the right, Ricardo Legareta from Mexico City. At, on, along the street where those sort of radio-shaped objects are, Lawrence Halpern and me making stuff for the, uh, for the, uh, the eye level viewer. Um, and then 
on the way down from the, this Acropolis to the very lively but small scale uh, downtown on Broadway uh, where Chicano cars cruise um, is um, a low income, a lower income housing piece with a Frank Gehry Park at the, the bottom. Um, so this was us um, in charge of making something around a, a, an inclined railway saved from the past that came up through it uh, with uh, various things recollective of the small scale stuff that lies at the bottom of the hill on its way to the giants on top with parks um, with huge fountains and stages and pieces, these by Larry Halpern and myself, that go from a major avenue up here, which we were also responsible for, uh, down the hill to the backside of the project. Um, my favorite detail, I guess, on this 100 foot high, a piece which is made to, to look as though the old Victorian house, one of the old Victorian houses of Bunker Hill has been squashed into it and then mirrored um, on this, our uh, statues of, uh, well, I think of them as Marx and Lenin, um, but uh, they can be anybody you want. They have hair of, of uh, Bougainvillea and beards of, of Wisteria. Uh, <laughs> and in, in Peking, the, they have uh, pictures of, of, uh, of, of Marx and Engels that um, have two-toned beards, and I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, these are pictures, the next to last, of, uh, of, of a, a, a surprise winning scheme for, for the Tegel Lake in Berlin, which I'll go through very quickly, but um, it includes a housing facing south and north to the lake along the bottom edge, a uh, big recreation island um, where you see it, um, and then a cultural center um, in this edge. Um, not far away in the back of that picture is uh, Carl Friedrich Schinkel's Schlesslein Tegel, and this is an attempt to, uh, to um, honor its presence here with a set of somewhat Schinkelian pieces that are crossed with a set of um, 19th century warehouses along the, the lake that are meant to be simpler uh, and uh, dumber. Uh, the, the island is there. Well, the model in our minds was, was uh, those, were those numerous tropical ports with, where people maintain a considerable amount of privacy and identity even while a cruise ship with a thousand people on it comes uh, into their harbor because the ship is, is a little bit distant from them across the water. And uh, we thought that, that this public facility, the a pool with wave machine and all, could uh, preserve the privacy, could allow the privacy of the people on shore to be preserved by getting out of their way a little bit. Uh, these are pictures in the cultural center for the library with a two-story wall of books. And uh, an end of the just behind there is, is that uh, uh, place to take off in a boat acro across the water. Um, here are the the ship. There a tower at the end. Um, and here a uh, a final uh, uh, an up to date view that puts more trees and less solid stuff on, on that island, makes it less ship-like, more Isolabella like The picture that I just flashed by on the left was Dayton, Ohio, where uh, I mean to develop the final section of, of this discussion from. Uh, Dayton is a city that, that had a terrible flood from the great Miami River that goes through its uh, boundaries. Uh, some 60 years ago, and they've had levees along its bank ever since. There have been a lot of disagreement about how to do with, with it, and a set of people were asked, ourselves included, to make a proposal. We proposed needing to get the job away from the others who were proposing it, the usual workshops, um, 
a storefront office, and then we also proposed a set of one hour of prime time television uh, performances in which we would act like kind of architectural short order cooks uh, with a bank of six telephones with people calling up and uh, saying what they wanted and are trying to meet their needs there in front of everybody on, on the camera. Uh, we had a lot of other leading things leading up to this. Uh, gypsy violinists that would uh, uh, allow us to take people on luncheon trips to look at this unfamiliar riverfront and draw it. Workshops, as on the left, where, uh, where people would uh, put on paper what groups of 50 or so, what they wanted. Um, a storefront office where uh, we took some 3,000 uh, uh, suggestions and visits from people. Um, here they are visiting. And the television programs in which we pontificated, as I'm doing there. Or uh, Drew, as one of my partners is doing here, and as I usually did, um, to, uh, to make things that people wanted. All this as we get closer and closer, not to being ashamed of doing what people want, uh, but to having things that people can, can feel good about. Here's a model that came apart so that we could, when people called up and said, get rid of that high rise, you know how I hate high rises, we'd <laughs> throw it aside and then someone else would call and, and, uh, and say, you bring that high rise right back. <laughs> and so we, we would, it was easy. Um, with um, drawings to help show what was gradually developing, models. Um, and um, uh, some short range as well as long range things. This was something that could be done right away to show that something was happening. Um, it was a fountain sponsored by the Kiwanis and the Garden Club uh, with, it was ecological, it's got a windmill. Um, and uh, the pulls water up to uh, to cans full uh, that become full of it, and then uh, they uh, let it down through pretty little uh, downspouts onto the roses, which are tended by members of the Dayton Garden Club in canoes. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, there's already been a, a rather fancy wedding on this fountain with uh, all the bridesmaids and canoes and everything. <laughs> uh, we, we learned how to do it better in Roanoke, Virginia, where we did much the same thing, but uh, knew enough this time to, uh, to be getting developers and money in line at the same time that we were doing what uh, people felt good about. What did result is that uh, for the first time in many years, the bond issues that had to do with building these things in downtown Roanoke were, were all passed by a set of people who were familiar with it and not suspicious because it had all been done by them if they wanted and in front of their very eyes. Um, the last thing, and for me the most exciting yet, um, is a church done this time without television, but uh, for a, a, a rather special Episcopal uh, community in, in a, a wealthy suburb of Los Angeles who had just had a terrible fight about uh, whom to pick for a new rector when their, old, their one of 30 years retired. They had come to believe that they couldn't agree with each other about what day it was. And so they put into the architect's contract, their old church had burned down, they needed a new one. They put into the architect's contract that, uh, um, that he had to get a 67% vote of the parish in favor of this building before it, it could be okay. And we foolishly signed such a contract. We realized that, that, that to make that work, we had to do something that wasn't just us designing something and then trying to peddle it, but was uh, the whole community doing what I started out talking about, um, themselves coming to the images and, and uh, visions of what their church should be like. So we started with sixth grade stuff. 
which we usually do in these cases, Fruit Loops and and uh, uh, and scissors and and cellophane and parsley, um, and uh, ask people to make their images of of the church they wanted. Uh, there's one on the left. The second time we came back with uh, quantifications of those things they had said they wanted, um, and um, a kind of set of pieces that could be worked in model or a two-dimensional version of them that we that we presented. We also did a kind of Rorschach test of a hundred slides of things that of churches across the world to see what they thought was suitable for St. Matthew's. Um, the three most popular slides that we showed, though they weren't together, were all of Alvar Alto's Voxeniska Church in Imatra, um, though they said they wanted dark wood and that's white. Um, the most unpopular church, the one they least wanted for St. Matthew's was St. Peter's in Rome. Um, <laughs> Um, the magic moment happened the second time after we had uh, given out with the pieces and there were seven tables of about 20 people each and each of them came up with the same plan um, serendipity I think it's called it also made our task very much easier but there were some differences about where the choir would be but that day we had a plan the next time we met all day Sunday a month later um, we came with our dollhouse size uh, models of, uh, of buildings that could be put over uh, versions of that plan. And again, five out of six tables chose the same one. So we had a building. Um, and then there were lots of, of, uh, of directions from them as on that left-hand screen about uh, where the windows ought to be and things like that. Let us come up with a, with a scheme. Um, a Latin cross with, with uh, half a lips of seating around an altar, um, a glassy chapel, and views of the, prayer, the existing prayer garden, which reminded them of the past, um, next to but not behind the altar. We had uh, the great detail uh, goes into. Uh, this kind of imagery and acceptance we found. In Southern California, the, the most logical, best thing to make a floor out of is um, Spanish tile from Mexico, or Spanish type terracotta tile from Mexico, which is inexpensive and uh, good stuff. Uh, that, however, uh, for this Anglican uh, congregation, uh, was Spanish, therefore Roman, therefore not acceptable. Uh, so we ended up with, with uh, with gray slate in the little pieces and the terracotta and the others, which brings it at least halfway across the Bay of Biscay toward Devon and uh, makes, it, uh, makes it okay in Southern California for an Anglican congregation. Um, and uh, so that's what we have. Uh, we have here a kind of compromise between a, a rose window, which was wanted by the higher church people, and uh, kind of ordinary industrial mullions, which was thought appropriate by the low church people in the, in the parish. And little by little, we're getting some red and blue stained glass into these places that we didn't color, uh, pulling some tricks. Uh, the, uh, a model got made, lit up from inside. And uh, when the 67% vote was required, we got an 83% vote. Um, and buildings getting built. We're very proud of ourselves. Um, it's certainly the case in uh, our time that uh, um, that the the, ag <laughs> the agreements that uh, that made everything okay and San Trofim and Arl over there um, that many centuries ago. Uh, do not altogether persist today. Uh, that is, to, to uh, make our own place, uh, we find ourselves often altogether at odds with all the people around us. And uh, uh, we need, to, uh, we need to, to cope with that as best we can. But um, I think a good deal of inspiration can come out of even some works of, like this one of a century ago in an upstate New York, Town where 
the people in, in this congregation had clearly seen probably a postcard of Shark, um, and, um, and they, they were proud of their several hundred year old heritage, wanted to continue it, felt no pain about uh, their connections with the past and, and a, a great desire for that. They were, however, not stonemasons, but um, woodworkers with um, um, newly developed 19th century tools and techniques. And so what they did was something that came out of their heads, their memories and their minds, um, a recollection of Chartres, but also out of their hands and, and hearts, um, a, a wooden building. And if we, with our techniques and our memories, can do anything like as well, I think that's what we should be doing. Thank you. of a, a splendid feast of fun and informality, which I think we all enjoyed very much indeed. Um, Charles Moore has said he will answer questions, and I'm sure... I didn't know I was going to talk so long when I said that, but I will. Anyway. Well, they're very pleased, everybody. We're all very pleased you talk so long. We hope you'll stay a little longer and perhaps answer a few of our questions. Um, anybody who feels, please start straight away with a, a question of any sort. There are microphones around. It's, they're a little intimidating, but they do help people at the back of the hall to hear what the question is. Is there somebody that'll have a go? It's all perfectly clear. Well, no, I, it's ambiguous, actually. <laughs> I wonder if I dare start the ball rolling. You were a professor of architecture at Yale for five years, and you talked about theory following practice. One of the things I would like to ask, if I'd been a student at that time, about theory and sort of definitions, is how would you explain kitsch? In a much more kindly way, I suspect, than uh, some of my colleagues. Uh, I think that, that the worry about whether our things are going to be worthy or not. Uh, that is, whether they're going to slide into kitsch and therefore be irresponsible or somebody low class, and more importantly, whether we're going to be less important because we've uh, slipped some way into kitsch. That that worry is, a, is a, an unworthy one. That um, if buildings are to, to speak, as I claim they must, and to speak in different um, tones and voices and ways um, in different circumstances, then they have to be allowed the right, and their, their architects have to be allowed the right too, to be um, winsome or trivial or downright silly, if that's, if that's a part of the situation, if, if, that, um, if, if that's appropriate. And um, if they can't, if we always have to be of savings and loan level serious, then we, we by that act, deny buildings the right to, uh, to speak and ourselves the right to, to have the kind of richness we need to, to make a world that we can comfortably inhabit. So if we do stuff that is sufficiently trivial so that someone else calls it kitsch, so that Ken Frampton condemns it, uh, then uh, then okay. Uh, I, I don't see how we can, can uh, in freedom and all good conscience, do our thing freely without, uh, without running that risk and sometimes slipping into to catch. We all hope that we uh, stay just at the edge of it and uh, hardly ever are caught falling in. 
kitsch isn't necessarily a bad thing, is it? I mean, it's not, it's not a naughty word. It, it, trans, it goes past being a naughty word to become an accepted thing, or not. I, 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 my question to you is, how would you explain it to a student? Because I, I'm never quite sure what kitsch is, and therefore perhaps I thought we, we all might I, I learn think it. My impression, what, you know, what turns... I mean, Ken Frampton turns a different color when kitsch is mentioned. In the same, <laughs> in the same way that Aldo Rossi turns a different color when freedom is mentioned. <laughs> uh, and it's a, um, I take it that that means that it's a, a charged um, phenomenon. I, I think what it means is um, is stuff that uh, that is um, so immersed in the everyday and trivial that it seems to border on the 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 vulgar and to be so that you wouldn't want your daughter to marry one. <laughs> um, the, and that's uh, that's <laughs> anybody. Charles, would you tell us what you think Kish is? Is that fair? Charles Jenks. Um, well, um, I feel put on the spot uh, partly because Charles is a close friend. And um, Why don't you I, try? yeah, well, I feel like it. Um, <laughs> Kitsch is from the German, uh, like Ersatz, uh, coined in the 19th century as, as a pejorative word. Ersatz me meaning a substitute for something real. Kitsch meaning uh, something similar, meaning uh, industrial rubbish. Or some kind of sentimental claptrap, uh, usually used um, by demagogues or advertisers or people meant meaning to uh, persuade us of something and sell us something shoddy, which we later wake up the next morning to not enjoy. So it has, um, if one uses kitsch in a canonic way, it has irretrievably damaging uh, properties, damaging to your health from a psychic point of view, and probably damaging to other parts of the body. Uh, and it seems to me that some of your work you show tonight, Charles, and some of your attitudes toward it are so accommodating of um, those, the negative aspects of kitsch, that, uh, you know, Frampton's turning red is quite, um, <laughs> quite appropriate. And, and I'm angered. Well, uh, which means, you know, since I know you so well, and, and uh, since you're such a good friend, I know that um, <laughs> you're, uh, in a way, meaning to provoke us. That's where your um, desire to be more interesting than best uh, or first rather than good. I'm getting these Mises, Mises and Venturi mixed up in my mind. It was Mises who said I'd rather be good than interesting, and it was Venturi who said I'd rather be best than first. Well, clearly, you're, you're, you'd rather be slightly provocative and more interesting than you'd be good. Uh, and I know that b behind that, uh, let, uh, let me say, be because I know you so well, I know that how you relate to... Uh, American architecture, which has suffered, believe me, I mean, you know, I've lived in England for 17 years, having left America for 17 years. I know that American architects have, as Colin Rose says, the architecture of good intentions um, and puritanical intentions has led to a really deteriorated situation. And in that sense, um, more modest um, and, and understated and whimsical and winsome and trivial uh, other values which you've put forward uh, has, has, have righted certain situations. And in that sense, it seems to me uh, I would defend all of the things that, that make me squirm, nevertheless. So um, this is a very long question, isn't it? It isn't a question. Yeah, it's brilliant. But um, <laughs> I, I feel distinctly uneasy um, if we don't put you against all of those other very macho designers in, in America who through their architecture of good intentions has led to a lot of, well, I would, I call it international style kitsch in a way. Um, so, you know, I'd much prefer your variety. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you raise your hand, John, back. 
Anybody? Somebody fairly just have a go at that. Here's a chance. All feeling a little nervous. You could get me, I'm exhausted. Eh? No, no, they're all a little nervous, sort of frightened of the microphone, intimidated by all your magnificent work and fun. But everybody's smiling. What about somebody from Australia? Mention their names, just watch my eyes. Have you any kids in Australia? Chris? No, perhaps you have no question. When do you stop the Which, who would like to give an example? The Italian Palace, I mean the Italian... Which project? Kahn's <laughs> Gallery, though it's not, I think, so good as Thomas Jefferson's University, is, is certainly better than anything else on our, our continent by, by some lengths. I think, though, that um, uh, much as any of us would like to be great and to do things that, that are, are deeply meaningful, uh, with accent on the deep. Um, it seems to me that, that many architects uh, watched for the last few decades have come to no good end when, when they set out in a, in a, a fervent pursuit of, well, I remember when Yamasaki discovered beauty. That was the end. Uh, the, before that, he had done some really, I think, very interesting work, but he took a trip around the world and discovered about the Taj Mahal and other beautiful things and came back plunged or lunged after beauty and never, I believe, uh, uh, hit it or did whatever you do to it, um, hit it with a stick. Um, the, in much the same way, I think that to, uh, to lunge after deepness is uh, is very likely self-defeating. Uh, my suspicion is that uh, the only way to have the chance of doing something uh, deep and wonderful sometime is to um, is to go after the specifics, to try to solve the problems and uh, and uh, contact the images of, of um, the people who want it, make a pleasant, supportive. Um, place, um, whereas others have lately said one could take one's grandmother, um, and um, and then hope that maybe in, you live long enough so that uh, that one or more of them will be uh, great. Probably not so great as the Kimball Museum, but but pretty great. So I'm I don't get upset at uh, at not having hit it yet. I've got months to go. Um, <laughs> and um, and I, it would be sort of awful to, to, to hit it really hard years before you were going to kick off and then just sit around waiting for the end. Um, <laughs> Uh, can, a, can a building uh, speak to people uh, in an abstract way, or do you think it has to be literal? 
Uh, I notice you're introducing literal elements or variations on them into your buildings at the moment. I've changed my attitudes about that gradually, as I guess was evident over the last 20 years or so. I used to to think that uh, that the elements had to be more or less cosmic to be worthy of inclusion, and increasingly I find myself relying on on, uh, on the literal, like Italy and in the Italian piazza. Um, I don't know whether that's just out of the desperation that comes with middle age, or uh, or whether I, but I. I don't think it is. I think there's something about our world and its changes that uh, that has made not only me but lots of others uh, more interested in, in the, the specific, even the flat-footed, um, the literal, uh, as a way of, of coming closer, quicker to people. I, I think uh, as, as I, for one, and I think there are lots of others like this, uh, have grown more... Uh, um, uh, more aware of, of our of the failure of, of our architecture to uh, to reach people, um, to interest them, and make them want to send postcards from it. Uh, we find ourselves uh, more and more uh, depending on, on being literal and straightforward and, and trying to connect. Maybe this is the same lunging that I was just deploring in. Yamasaki and, and others, but uh, it seems to me a part of our times. You did suggest there was more content in Disneyland than most people, most architects would give credit for. I think Disneyland is one of the most um, multiply layered um, visions of reality that um, that our, at least that our continent uh, possesses. Yeah, I'm writing a, a guidebook to Los Angeles at this point and uh, find myself in my chapter on Disneyland uh, noting more more things that are real uh, than uh, than I can for any other chapter. Of course, Noel Coward said that the uh, thing about Los Angeles is that what is so uh, uh, so real, whatever is real seems so phony there and what's phony seems so real. So I may have it all backward because of my Los Angeles uh, uh, connections. But, uh, but I, I think that, that it's evident that Disneyland uh, stands in for the, the missing public realm in uh, Southern California in ways that are remarkably uh, rich and complex. There are a lot of things it doesn't do. Um, it's it's a, a much more restrictive place than, than really public places are, that is when the 60s were going strong, they kept out young men with uh, long hair, and I guess young ladies with short hair, and uh, there was no way of, of stopping them from doing that. So I don't want to set it up as an ideal democracy in its workings, but, uh, but I think that the, the number of, of connections with people's minds and memories, uh, recollections, all the way from, from the, the really uh, gooey sentimentality of, of some of it, and that altogether nothing that's of, of the, the literary part, to, um, to some really transcendent moments, mostly uh, while you're in fast motion, uh, is, is a real wonder. The question concerns probably the church project that you talked about at the end. And given that most of us sort of find a place or, or go through this business of finding a place in a situation which we've had no control over, you know, the situation is given and we find a place within it. Um, and while I can understand why in that particular project needing the 60% um, approval for the design, you might have adopted that method of working. I wonder whether there were any real surprises in it for you in the sort of information that came out. 
whether you would have arrived at, at a design very much different from that um, had you proceeded you know, in another way, a normal way? Answer, yes, I would have arrived at a, a quite different design, I think. Um, and I, in fact, made a design before as a sort of, uh, uh, what do scientists call it, a hedge, I'll call it. I, I made a design of what I thought would be a neat church for there and put it away and didn't ever try to uh, sell it to the, there's, it's an unsymmetrical, um, very vertical thing that bears no relation to, uh, to what, they, what they picked. But what did please me about that, and I guess it's important to note, um, the rector of the church, in fact, brought it to my attention. It was in the middle of one, or at the end of one workshop after I'd been under pretty heavy attack from some blue-haired lady who, who, uh, um, who had called down the wrath of Jesus on me because the ceilings were too high and I was supposed to know that Jesus favored energy conservation. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, I smiled at the lady and, and we had an interesting conversation. And I, uh, some other people who were in favor of having a, a, the organ in a cool place came to my rescue and explained the worth of having the high ceilings and all. Um, the rector pointed out afterward that, that if I had been at all defensive at any point during that, I would have, have lost and lost the, the parish with it. But that I had managed at this stage in my later years to, uh, to smile beatifically through uh, any such attacks and to think nothing but lovely thoughts about that blue-haired lady. Uh, <laughs> and to, uh, and that, that, that somehow made it all right. If, if I'd been trying, to, if I'd been using this device to put over a scheme that I had in mind up my sleeve, uh, after they finally got done arguing about some other schemes and I'd slip it in, I would have been deeply disappointed and uh, it would not have worked. But what I can and do do from all that with, with a, a format, a scheme that that they made and like and, and feel supportive of, um, it seems to me it gets me in the same position that the Georgian house designer was when he already had the scheme, because everybody had that scheme. And uh, so he got to make uh, truly individual, personal, special um, plays on, on that scheme in the detailing or in, in, in pieces of it and didn't have to be defensive about the whole business. Just the same, I, by going with the flow um, for the scheme, can, can uh, assert myself. I've got some 12-foot uh, high evangelists in there now out of the Book of Kells made of pine boards that knock your eyes out. Um, and I feel very close to those evangelists, and, and especially St. Matthew, whom I'm polychroming, um, he being a saint of the church. Um, and I can do that with everybody's feeling of some comfort because we're all we're operating off a common base, which is the scheme of the church itself. And so I feel very good about that, and I don't think that I've lost in effectiveness um, and mobility nearly so much as I've gained. Um, you uh, say an antithesis between the uh, rational and the real, if I'm not mistaken. And I wanted to know whether you considered that the real, the essential attribute of the real, was that it would be retrospective, uh, even nostalgic, or that it would be something that would re-evoke, in essence, uh, some formal, even on a formal level, something of uh, past mythological or architectural language? Uh, I think the real has in it, uh, in the sense that I was using it, the, I think it's more accurate to call it the conventional 
is what people are are familiar with, used to, in the same way that Venturi was using conventional last night to uh, um, to talk about things that were already in place. Um, that conventional, which is an unloaded word, and therefore it seems to be better, sometimes slips into uh, nostalgia, which is, I suppose, the kitsch of convention, um, and uh, is therefore less desirable, more suspect than, than the non-nostalgic uh, aspects of, of convention. I guess what nostalgia means, it, it, I looked it up one time because I decided I was going to start using it as a positive word to confound my adversaries and uh, um, discover that it isn't really a positive word at all. The dictionary is quite clear about its being um, kind of low life. Um, but uh, but I, I, and so it, it is clearly not, not desirable to slip into it. But again, as with, with Kitsch, I think if we, if we too tightly gird ourselves against the possibility of slipping into it, we lose a lot of the, the freedom and the ease with which I think we have to be armed in order to, uh, to proceed. So let's say conventional, not nostalgic, except Sometimes. Uh, yes, behind. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, I probably didn't express that well. I thought you meant by the rational, the sort of uh, more cerebral, more abstract. That's and what the, I. That's, and that's what I think they mean. The rationalists that, are always saying that rational is. What, that some things are rational, and I. The only thing I can figure out is that it doesn't include anything I've ever done. There's something. Um, and, uh, and that, yeah, I guess it's like a yacht and the expenses thereof. If you have to ask, you can't join. Uh, so I'm, I'm probably not the one to describe what rational means, but uh, I think it does indeed mean, uh, uh, mean uh, cerebral, uh, abstract, uh, the one thing following from the other and not including these um, will-o'-the-wisps uh, like our memories and our, mm -hmm. our pasts and, and um, the things that are special to each of us um, and um, therefore not easily organizable. That, and, the, um, and the real would be retrospective, at least in that sense. I think so. Would have to be. I think it has to be. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. On the terrace with striped shirt. Following your uh, endeavours to make a sense of space for people to relate to and live in, what are your feelings on? revisiting uh, a couple of your housing schemes that I can think of in New Haven which have been par parts of which have been uh, rather badly treated and beaten up by maybe the people who live there I don't know uh, there there are two that I send people to when they ask to go see a housing from the American Great Society of some of a decade and a fraction ago uh, one is something called Church Street South in New Haven, which is a disaster, and one is Whitman Village in Long Island, which I showed tonight, which is uh, um, something like a success. Uh, the, we have some other successes and some other disasters. Uh, the Church Street South in New Haven, for instance, which was supposed to be a co-op, um, has never almost 15 years later, been made into a co-op because the, the landlords and the tenants are fighting so hard with each other they can't manage to get into the same room to sign the papers. Um, and the place has uh, uh, some unkind references to people's sexual preferences uh, squirted on all the walls. And uh, uh, the only trees that have survived are the pine trees, which are so prickly that you can't take hold of them which is why we planted them. Um, the, um, 
the other Whitman Village is uh, has the grass nicely mowed, the houses in good shape, the trees pretty, and uh, the buildings looking modest but pleasant as they always have. Um, I don't think the difference is is in the the architecture. I think that that our expectations of the earlier 60s that buildings could uh, by themselves change the social climate and make uh, life beautiful for people for whom it had previously not been. Um, those hopes were um, hopelessly exaggerated. Um, what I think I would pull back to is the belief that uh, that given a more or less acceptable social scene that uh, that buildings can can marginally make it well a big wide margin too can make them it pleasanter more fun to wake up in the morning with the sunshine um, and um, 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 this cause the inhabitants to, to uh, have aspects of a of a unpleasanter life um, so I, I I don't think that all the devices that we used in Church Street South uh, to make special places and all by themselves uh, could change the dismal lives of, of, the, of the people who, who moved in, and they don't think so either. I, I think certainly one of the more real aspects of, of architecture now in the 80s is that we've got a a little less inflated and more realistic sense of uh, of what we can with buildings do, which is a lot still. I'll take two more, and then I think we must um, begin to wind up. Thank you. One more after this. No. Yeah. <coughs> it seems to me, Charles, from the last three projects, I think, that you showed, particularly from the church, that what you are asking yourself and, I guess, other architects to do is to start living really dangerously by extending this notion of inhabitation from the building itself into the design of the building itself. So they inhabit not just the built thing, but the process whereby the built thing is created. say something. Yes, <laughs> to be sure. No, I think that uh, all those things I was showing, that, that uh, endless retrospective, was uh, for me heading inevitably in, in that direction. I think that uh, uh, to, to make places which people can feel comfortable about, can inhabit in the full sense that I think they must, requires not only that as I thought once, that we we uh, bring into existence uh, images that that touch people, that make them feel comfortable and on top of things, but that um, that they develop their own sense of of having of having been responsible, of, of having it be their thing. Now, obviously, it can't always be everybody's thing. Buildings last longer than people, and some buildings are inherited, but some way that's easier um, to, to come into a building that, that is already there. To, uh, to have somebody make for you a building that isn't yours is, I believe, one of the, the common and desperate uh, uh, problems of, of our time. And there are lots and lots of people sitting in, in uh, buildings that they, don't, that they wish were theirs but aren't. And I think if we're going to make it work, we have to... Uh, to do the deprofessionalizing, the sharing, um, much more than any of us has, has dreamed of yet. I think one of the big reasons why your work is so important today in our particular uh, age and why we like it so much is the fact that you obviously take great trouble to consult people all kinds of people as to what they want and expect from you as an architect. Uh, many architects don't do that. 
Yet, your work to me has a great personal flavor. You are a creative artist, and you show this comes through in your work. You can tell a Charles Moore building, even though you work with, closely with your partners. So, I'd like, if you wouldn't mind, you to say a few more words about uh, how you manage to do that, how you manage to give your work a strong personal flavor, and yet, at the same time, go to enormous trouble to find out what your clients and the inhabitants of your buildings wish. Thank you, that's a very nice question. Um, <laughs> um, um, I remember being on a television program once in New York many years ago when there were a group of architects, uh, uh, Morris Lapidus and I remember were in, in the second group of not so hot architects and Philip Johnson and a number of others were in the first group of swell architects. <laughs> and uh, the, the hostess for the TV series was uh, saying to Philip Johnson, whom she obviously admired greatly, don't you think architecture is like a, a red feather? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> well, that's, uh, well, sure. <laughs> um, it turned out that, that she thought it was like a red feather because it was uh, beautiful. Um, and then the clients all kind of mucked around with it and dragged it through the dust by having their own squalid little requirements. Um, and uh, I broke in, which was very bad form apparently, and because uh, <laughs> uh, I was soon shut up and I noticed that part didn't go on the air. But uh, I claimed that, uh, that a, a better image than her red feather uh, was, was a Chinese uh, painter of whatever period that, that uh, charges a brush full of, of, um, of ink and then onto silk or, or rice paper uh, uh, lays it. Um, so that um, depending on, on, uh, on the connection between that brush full of ink and, and this paper with its own irregularities and specialnesses and, and quirks and um, bizarre qualities, um, there, there comes something. If the painter is skillful, drags the brush at the right speed, um, the painting comes out the way he, he wants it to. But it's very bad form to blame the paper if the, if the <laughs> image is irregular. Um, and it seems to me in, that the clients can fit into this as, as, the, as the paper <coughs> in the architect's brush. It, it, it's their special qualities and, and um, in energies and enthusiasms that, uh, that makes the thing happen just as much as the, as the brush charged with ink, which is, I guess, us, if I may use that macho uh, uh, simile. Um, and um, and it's, it's, the clients are as important as the, as the paper is to the, the Chinese painter in, in making something happen. Um, so I, I don't think that, that um, our own, as architects, our own uh, capacities and energies are in any way dulled by the, the by listening to the client doing um, something uh, with him, I, but only extended. And, and I can't imagine a really good building without a decent client. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it only really rests for me now to, on your behalf, to thank Charles Moore for a, an enchanting presentation of slides and pictures and images of reality and rationality, of ambiguity and, re and order of um, first and best. I put the two together with an and, not with a, an or. And to thank you very much for a a very splendid evening, particularly as you've done this on your holiday and you started the evening talking about postcards and when you're on your holiday, perhaps you'd send us all a postcard and we'll treasure them all very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>